Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. This episode is titled Catching the Big Spanish, and we're going to be talking with Captain Rob Corley of Sandbar Safari Charters out of the Emerald Isle area. We're going to be covering such topics as bait, as rigs, as presentation, and then we're going to finish with a couple of recipes. We're going to finish with a little bit of cooking info. My name is Gary Hurley, Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post has been serving the saltwater fishing community of North Carolina since 2003. We've been bringing you fishing reports, fishing information, fishing tournaments, fishing schools. And now here we are in this latest and greatest chapter of the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. It's in this podcast series that we reach out to our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast and ask them to share with us their thoughts, their insights, their knowledge on how to catch more fish more often. And our true goal is to empower you, to give you, a, to give you a knowledge, to give you confidence, to get you and your family out on the fr- and family and friends out on the water, spending more time together more often. I'm joined in this ev- endeavor, this episode endeavor with Billy Thorpe of Copilot Studios. Hey, Billy, here we are. What's up, Gary? Good to see you, man. Yeah, man. Good to be talking to you again. Good to be talking to hear soon with Rob Corley about fishing, man. One of our longstanding friends of mine, of Fisherman's Post, and just an easy dude to talk to, full of knowledge. Yeah, I'm excited about the recipes. I didn't know that was on the docket, so. Recipes are on the docket. As a foodie, I'm in. I'm excited. And yeah, like, we're not talking about false albacore. Although I'm sure that there is someone out there that has cooked a false albacore and believes it was good. But aside from that, this is legit. Somebody's eaten the false albacore and thought, man, this is so Man, good. I just nailed that recipe. Someone has. Just crushed it. Probably someone who hasn't eaten good food, but whatever. It's all right. Well, Gary, let's talk about our sponsors a little bit, shall we? We got RA Hitch, uh, Raleigh Apex Hitch, Hitches, Trailers, Bike Racks, and more. Chris and his team up there, man, just doing a great job. Uh, So if you're in need of any of these items for your truck, for your setup, be sure to go check out those guys and uh, support them because they're supporting us, your favorite fishing podcast. And if it's not your favorite fishing podcast... Then you should move it up the list, your favorite one. <laughs> and I, I've seen this through the years with Fisherman's Post. You know, on you know, we all want a good deal. We all want value. But on some level, you know, people love doing business with people that are like them, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's you know, that fishing connection or something. I mean, you still got to have value. You still got to have product. And clearly he is. If you check out that website, man, it is Quality. a professional operation. And then the kicker is you're also supporting someone that's supporting, you know, supporting a podcast and it's part of the fishing community. I like that. Yeah, I like man. that a lot. Like it a lot. And speaking of supporting the fishing community, we got Marine Warehouse Center, which they are, if you're in the fishing community at all, you've probably seen them around different events, things like that. So I got a quick video from them and we'll be right back. Hey, it's Robbie with Marine Warehouse Center in Wilmington and Charleston. We are headquarters for Pair Custom Boats. These center consoles are handmade in Washington, North Carolina, and are custom designed for fishing and family fun on the water. Right now, we have several models in stock, and build times on the custom orders are around five months. These boats are custom built to fit your needs, from the seating, the tops, the leaning posts, and the live wells. You design the entire layout of your boat. Come by and see for yourself why they're one of the fastest growing boat builders in the country. I got Strong. one thing. I got one thing to say about that. Boy, that sure sounds good. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Boy, that sure sounds good. But it's strong, man. I like I like their vibe. I like their video, and uh, certainly like those guys. You know, we make the point to say it's not just sales, although they absolutely are sales. And you want to talk to them sooner as opposed to later because the boat market is crazy out there. But they can help you navigate it. You know, they can help you at least get something on order. But man, those guys are service. Those guys are parts. Um, those guys are part of the fishing community. Telling jokes, <laughs> eh, but service, sales, parts, <laughs> they're hitting home runs. Telling jokes, no, maybe Terrell. I mean, you're, you're kinder to them than I am. I mean, I'll tell you the latest. I, you know, you seem to enjoy them. Yeah, so I'm go. happy to tell you. Why should you, and this is Terrell, I like to make clear at the beginning of every joke. This is Terrell. This is not Gary. Why should you never date a fisherman? I don't know. Well, there's probably a million reasons out there, but for the purposes of this joke, what Terrell said is, they'll only string you along. 
Okay. All right. You Google that one. What did you not? Terrell Terrell told me this joke. I didn't Google anything. Terrell, you can do better, man. You can do better. (laughs) I liked it, but it was. He's busy. I mean, getting the boating season underway. Maybe he just needs a little bit more time to reflect. That's probably true. You know, good comedians got to take their time curating jokes. So it'll be all right. You got it, Terrell. I'm a believer. To (laughs) to bring it back to fishing, let's look at a fish photo. (laughs) Here we go. We got Maxie Feimster. I hope I pronounced that right. If not, I apologize with a permit that she caught using shrimp in the surf at Cherry Grove. Look at that thing. That's a, she got that thing in a headlock, man. She, that thing ain't getting no, no Well, getting it's no an there. odd catch. I think she wants yeah. to hold on to it because not everyone's pulling a permit out of the surf. That's for yeah. sure. That is a special catch. You know, it sort of caught our attention. Yeah, that thing's awesome. That's good. Good pick. A good picture pick, Gary. Well, thank good. you. <laughs> picture okay anyway i don't know where else are we at here gary are we, are we just buying some coffee do you like coffee man i love when someone buys me uh, a cup of coffee and dude people have been buying us coffees and so generous so we really appreciate you guys who are supporting uh gary and i personally through buying us some coffees uh, and if you are interested in buying us coffee you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash fisherman's post and it's uh basically a platform where creator content creators can go and sign up and people can support them through there and so we've got an account and people are are helping us out i mean they're sending us some coffees and and show ideas so we really appreciate that uh, yeah it's awesome it's always nice to feel appreciated it's as simple as that always nice my wife tells me that too yeah she didn't buy you any coffee i saw i was checking see if your wife did she She did not buy me any coffee (laughs) yeah my wife's like hey uh, i know you've been doing that coffee thing on your podcast Actually, that's a Can lot. Can I have your login know. info to that account? Where's, your login? Where's that money going? Show, <laughs> show some proof, okay? I need a receipt. Yeah, that's how it rolls. <laughs> well, listen, Billy, I'm going to talk with Rob Corley, and we're going to talk about catching the big Spanish. And when I'm done talking with Rob, as is tradition, I'm coming back to you. I'm saying, Billy, what is Billy's best takeaway? I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm excited to hear what Rob's going to say. I'm going to guess it's going to be part of the recipe part of the portion. I'm just going to guess that in Maybe. advance. Maybe. Well, let's see. Let's bring on our guest. Let's bring on our guest, longtime friend of the newspaper of mine, Captain Rob Corley of Sandbar Safari Charters out of the Emerald Isle area. We're here to talk about catching the big Spanish, and we're talking about rigs and bait and presentation. How are you, Rob? I'm doing great, Gary. Good to see you guys. Man, always look forward to any kind of Rob time. And uh, so this is a treat for me, like talking to an old, not like talking to an old friend, talking to an old friend. But Rob, you've been on the show before. You uh, certainly know the routine. And before we can talk about catching the big Spanish, we've got two questions, two questions for you to answer. Are you ready, Rob Corley? I'm ready. Fire away. Question number one, pretty standard. Why should we stay tuned in? Why should we listen to anything you have to say about a Spanish mackerel? Um, I started live baiting for King Mackerel with my dad. And then when I started guiding, one of the favorite things I like to do was live bait Spanish mackerel. And that's usually how you catch the bigger ones. And we've been doing that pretty strong for like 12 years um, and put a lot of citations on the boat and just had a lot of experience doing it. And uh, it's, it's a good time. So happy to share some info on how to catch them. All right. So question number two, as is tradition, is a non-fishing related question. And uh, I don't think I really came up with a hard question. I don't think I challenged you nearly enough as I should challenge an old friend. But but at this point, we're moving forward. So, you know, I looked at sandbar safaris, uh, charters. You know, I like drinking beer on a sandbar. I like that a lot. That's one of my family summer activities. I also like drinking beer in a dive bar, sandbar dive bar. So my question to you, Rob Corley, give me two other bars that you like to have a drink in. Uh, I'd like to have a drink in a uh, craft cocktail bar, some fresh ingredients and some good mixed drinks. And uh, I like a tiki bar. Absolutely love a tiki bar. I think that's a very strong answer. That's better than I would have done. That's better than I have on my paper. I mean, I Googled some answers just in case he froze. I mean, he killed it, Billy. I was seeing not- trailer bar, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not classy enough for martini bars, so... Tiki craft cocktail you're knocking with craft cocktail but but that's one of the things we love about you rob corley let's go back to fishing so we're catching the big spanish that's our goal not to catch spanish but to catch the big spanish um in our show notes we said uh bait would be, probably be how you start the show off so what do you got for me rob let's talk about bait 
bait is to me the most important thing for catching the big Spanish. And uh, we use mostly menhaden and finger mullet uh, in my area. And it's common to have uh, a low availability of bait this time of year, but uh, usually here in a couple of weeks, once the water temperatures start to warm up, we'll get a lot of smaller menhaden in the backwaters. And uh, later into the summer, usually by the end of May, the finger mullet are getting big enough to and, and frequent enough schooling around to use those for baits too. And uh, catching a lot of frisky live bait and keeping frisky live bait in the well is what will keep getting you bites throughout the day on the Spanish. And uh, there's a lot of good ways to catch them on jigs and flies. And we can talk about some of that stuff later, but uh, most important thing is, is that bait and uh, getting the bait is, uh, you know, it's on you, you know, you got to do it with a cast net. There's very few places in our area um, and in North Carolina in general that sell live bait um, for trolling like menhaden and mullet and stuff. And uh, they have to be good and fresh and frisky. And if you put too many in your live well or they get beat up or you don't have enough flow in your system uh, to keep them good and fresh for four or five or six hours, then um, this the difference between dragging baits that don't look good and ones that are frisky and healthy is, is a huge difference in getting bites from these fish. So this episode is going to come out, and if it's not late May, it'll probably even be early June. So the bait is going to be there it'll by the here. time people are watching this, by the time this it'll is released. Here. So if we're people, in my mind, people love specifics. So the ideal size finger mullet, the ideal size pogey, if you could pick it, would be? Well, mac those mackerel love specifics too. And uh, I like a menhaden that's about three to four inches long. Same with the finger mullet. Um, that's easy enough for the mackerel to get in one bite and still get the hooks. Um, bigger baits, you'll still get bites on, but you'll miss a lot more fish typically. And uh, the smaller live baits we'll usually find outside of the waterway. They'll be up into the bays canals uh, and tributaries that feed into the waterway from further upstream. And usually the lower the tide, the further they'll come out uh, and the later in the season it gets, the further they'll come out. But starting in most of the month of May and through June, you'll be going to the back of all those bays, especially the higher the tide is, to find those right size baits. Um, we'll have a lot of large menhaden show up in our waterways and you can catch those in the deeper water uh, and then the channels connecting to them, but they're usually a little too big for the Spanish. Uh, ideally, they're great baits for king mackerel and other stuff, but they're, you really have to kind of go off of the beaten path sometimes to find those smaller menhaden uh, and perfect size finger mullets to use. Usually the smaller, the better, uh, but you come to a point of diminishing returns with the bait size if you're trolling uh, or if you've got any kind of chopper conditions out there because the little baits won't stay alive uh, as long when you're trolling if you've got some rougher conditions or if your boat pulls fast. So uh, just a, a comment I make is the, the faster your trolling speed or the um, rougher the conditions, the larger bait size you'll have to use because the smaller ones will die and not be pulling after three or four minutes. But on a calm day, they'll pull great. And if you're drifting or free lining, then they'll do real good. Man, for my listeners, viewers that only have one live well, um, are those baits able to cohabitate successfully? They are. Yeah, Minhaden and the Mullets do fine together. Um, what I would say if you've got a smaller live well <clears throat> is to, uh, if you catch a whole bunch of bait, save maybe six dozen or less in your live well and try to keep them really healthy. Um, and handling those smaller Minhaden especially when you net them and put them in the boat and into the live well uh, can really determine how long they last. If you get them all beat up in the deck of the boat or knock all their scales off and slime um, or, you know, have a giant net full of them and a lot of them get crushed on each other, then they won't last as long. Um, but if you can get six dozen good frisky ones in there and keep them healthy, that's enough baits for you to fish with. Absolutely. Um, and then you can save the rest of them and cut them into pieces for chum as you're fishing. And Spanish mackerel love chum. We can talk about that later uh, when, and when we talk about presentation and stuff. But the, uh, the lively baits are the most important part when you're, when you're live bait fishing for them. Okay. So what about, I mean, 
if live bait is the tri- is the the key, I mean not the only way, but sort of the key tactic. What is my? I guess this is where us transition to rigs. What is the the Rob Corley rig to take advantage of a live finger mullet, a frisky pogey? Uh, those two smaller baits. We use smaller uh, wire rigs, the Spanish mackerel have super sharp teeth, and my setup for big Spanish and live baiting Spanish in general is a 15 to 20 foot, 20 pound fluorocarbon leader uh, as a top shot on my line. So I'll tie that to the braid. I use braid backing um, on like 4,000 size spinning rod, uh, spinning reels and medium light spinning rods or medium spinning rods. And uh, it works really well for the Spanish because we fish light drags. They take fast runs and wear themselves out. And then you can game line, get the boat over to them. And um, we fish a very light drag for these fish so that they can make those fast runs without pulling the hooks. Uh, Because the hooks we're using on these rigs, I'll show you, they're very small. Usually I use a size eight treble hook, uh, two of them on a tandem rig. And if I use a live bait hook, it's a uh, size one or smaller. And uh, the Spanish mackerel can see very, very well. And so our hook size is really small. Our swivels are very small. I use a Spro 30 pound uh, micro swivels and having that long fluorocarbon connection to your braid 20 foot or even more if you want, uh, it really makes a difference in getting bit. So we use that long fluorocarbon leader top shot to a micro swivel and then about six to 10 inches, depending on how fast the bite is uh, and how calm it is. Usually if it's clear and calmer, we'll use a little bit shorter uh, leader. I usually will go with the, about 10 inches and then scale down if necessary to get the bites. And then that 10 inch section of wire leader, I usually use number two. Um, one, if they're really finicky or your baits are really small, but two will hold up to uh, bites from occasional bigger fish, king mackerel and barracudas and stuff like that. Uh, a little bit better than the size one wire is. Uh, I use straight wire, not braided wire or stranded wire. Um, and then that goes to, like I said, a number eight treble. And I got one right here that's a single rig. And usually when I'm trolling, I'll use double rigs uh, because the fish strike very fast and we're not really feeding them a bait. And there's always usually tension on the line. And so uh, with the tandem hook they get hooked a lot more often but i use these if they're real finicky or if i'm uh casting to them and sort of sight fishing when they're busting and you can see it's or you can't see because it's very small and very nearly invisible but it's a little tiny size eight treble hook and this one's about six seven inch long leader and that micro swivel and it's very very small rig but i've caught sharks and cobias and kings up to 30 40 pounds on on these i mean sometimes you get lucky but uh it's easy for them to a bigger fish to cut you off on the fluorocarbon with that short leader so if you got more kings around you can lengthen your leader uh your piece of wire and like i said if you're not getting as many bites usually the best thing to do for me is to make that lead wire shorter and uh that usually happens when it's really calm really clear dog days of august and stuff they'll get real finicky on the bite but that's my basic trolling live bait rig. And it, it works for most all men Hayden and finger mullet that are that size. Um, how you hook the bait on there is another thing uh, that's real important. And I'll usually hook uh, men Hayden through the side of their nose with the treble hook. And uh, with the back treble hook, I'll push it forward a little bit on the leader. So it's not, if the fish can swim naturally, it's not folding them in half and keeping them tight. And I'll just barely put one treble in his back. So it's just barely hanging in him. And that way it keeps that hook above where the fish is typically looking when he comes up to eat him. I found that that makes a difference too. Sometimes when that rear treble hook's just dangling behind the live bait, the fish that's coming up, usually from underneath it, he can see that and see that hook or see that terminal tackle or think it's a spiky fin or whatever. And sometimes it can turn him off, but it helps keeping that other little hook on top on the tandem rig. And then on finger mullet, I'll hook them uh, with one treble from the bottom up through the nose. Uh, but I don't like to close their lips with the, with the hook. I like to just get in the top part of their nose 
I just think they last a little bit longer. They can swim a little bit better that way than if you close them up. When's the application that you're using a single hook rig like you just showed us? I'll use it when uh, sometimes a good way to fish for them is off the anchor. Um, if you're trying to find fish, trolling is a good way to do it. And when we're trolling these live baits, we're going as slow as we can. I'll usually troll four baits, two short and two long, and they're all staggered so that um, they can go back and forth across each other and not get tangled. Sometimes you got to stay on it and manage them. And if it's a little windy, uh, tough conditions, I'll just fish three baits. And then uh, when I'm fishing, uh, uh, when I find a good area of fish, especially if it's on a smaller piece of rock away from everybody or something, uh, or there's not much boat traffic, you can anchor up and chum a little bit um and that's when i like to use the single hook rigs because when i'm i'm casting the busting fish and you can do that usually when i'm trolling i'll have one or two of those single hook rigs um because sometimes you'll see fish come up and break and they won't go for your baits and uh, if you throw lively uh one on a single hook rig right into them a lot of times they'll hook right up so i like that for sort of like a pitch bait um and especially when we're fishing off the anchor because we're usually casting the busting fish or, or, you know, throwing in with other baits that we're chunking in live. And uh, that's when I like to use the single hook. Uh, a lot of times when you're in the inlets, uh, especially on higher rising tides in June and July, those bigger Spanish will come on inside in the inlets. And a lot of times when I'm drifting for flounder or redfish in a bank or something in those areas, I like to have that single hook rig tied on because a little tiny finger mullet quick to the right, you know, it's usually an opportunistic thing where you'll see a couple of them come up and smash and they'll get away from you quick because they're real fast swimmers and inshore you really notice it because you'll see them bust in a channel and then two minutes later they'll be 100 yards down the channel you'll be like wow those fish are moving fast so you gotta have to be ready for them and if you can get a little finger mullet on real quick on that single hook and chuck it out in front of them they'll usually smash it well, I know you have other ways to target big Spanish other than live bait, but I'm really digging the live bait conversation right now. So I guess, sure. I mean, I'll have you transition into, I mean, we've got our bait, we've got our rigs. Um, I meant to ask why, and you can answer this once I finish setting up the question, why uh, spin and tackle as opposed to conventional tackle? I mean, I, but beyond that, you're heading out the inlet, like, how would you advise someone say, all right, you're prepared, you've got the gear, you're heading out the inlet. Here's what you should look for. Here's what you should do next to try to figure out where to deploy a couple of live bait rigs and start sure. trolling. Sure. If you can, uh, you can get those little baits and get you some nice rigs tied up and uh, you want to go usually anywhere two to eight miles offshore. Any artificial reef is good. Usually natural reefs and ledges are better. Um, the sharper the break on the ledge, usually the better. Those mackerel really like to stack uh, in numbers on those sharper breaks. And, uh, <clears throat> typically if you can find a ledge and just crisscross your way, trolling back and forth over top of it, uh, you'll find where they're located on the ledge. Uh, you can mark them on your sonar. A lot of times, if you're used to looking at it, they'll show up, uh, as a bunch of little streaky lines, little streaky red lines on there all together. And, uh, any presence of, uh, bait clouds, or any surface activity with the bait and birds is always a good sign. Uh, but usually if you troll around for an hour or two and you're not marking them and you're not getting bites, then that's when I'll ship off to the next spot. And uh, usually the fish will feed if they're there. And if your baits look good, something will happen. Um, and then certain times that they won't actually is usually when the moon's full. A lot of times they'll feed overnight. Those mackerel have big eyes. They can feed at night and, when they're real active uh, late and early like that, sometimes the middle of the day actually is when the best bite is. But the rest of the time, it's usually that first two to three hours of daylight and the last two hours of daylight. And uh, honestly, there's there's bigger Spanish as you come inshore, typically. The biggest ones uh, in May and June are usually right close to the beach. But they'll be a half mile to three miles off and on really good ledge structure that has bait on it and sometimes if the bait's at the artificial reefs really good the mackerel will be there by the hundreds thousands even uh sometimes they won't be anywhere around those places and they'll just be at, at the other ledges so you just sometimes have to hop around and and see where you know you're marking stuff i use my depth sounder a lot when i'm mackerel fishing looking for the fish and bait 
uh, just to give me an idea of if I'm in the right place. You mentioned before about um, if it's a little bit rough out there, it can challenge the keeping the bait alive or what size bait you use. Have you found anything like you would rather have it a slick, calm day or you like a little bit of action on the water? And, and does tide ever play into your, what you see as far as better results? Uh, current definitely does. Usually the more current there is on the ledges and the reefs, the better the fishing is for flounder, mackerel and everything. Um, so no current, no wind is when it's always the hardest to catch them. That's when it's the nicest to go out there. But um, if, if, and, and sun is a factor too. If it's cloudy, they'll bite a little bit better. If it's bright, sunny, um, especially midday, they'll usually turn off and, and get down deep uh, in the water column. So those real slick, calm days, uh, you just want to be out there early. It can be good fishing, but usually after the first two hours, it's done unless you're really starting to fine tune your tactics. And the, even then it can be tough getting bites. So I like to have like two foot seas spread out, two to three foot seas spread out with just a, a little bit of, you know, eight, 10 mile an hour wind. And that's perfect. And then uh, if it's too rough to troll properly, um, usually you can just jog up upwind of the structure and just start moving down current and put them in neutral and make a drift across and just do that over and over um, because you'll be slamming coming into the seas and it's hard to drag the baits. So typically I'll drift fish uh, if I'm out there and, it, and it's getting like that and we want to keep going. Um, and then water clarity uh, helps a lot too. Usually the cleaner the water, the better the fish are biting. Uh, they can see good, but that, that just brings a lot more bait and life into the near shore reefs. If it's real muddy and brown water and stained real bad, um, a lot of times that can happen on the, the lower ends of the tide cycles. And if we've had some rough weather followed by a pretty stretch and you get out there and it's all churned up, uh, usually get a lot of sharks when that's happening and not as good of a macro bite. So I'm usually looking for some cleaner water if I've run into that and usually find that running a little further offshore. And then sometimes, same if it's real clear and calm and there's no current, you can usually get a little bit of a wind riffle or maybe some more current by moving further offshore. And why do you like trolling for these bigger Spanish with spinning gear, not conventional? I like I like the spinning gear myself um, because the fish are very fast and you've got to be quick if they're running at you or you've got to be quick if you're getting spooled and you're going to game line. Um, and it's a light tackle application. We're fishing 10-pound braid and in some cases 20 uh, as the main line. So we're usually using really light tackle and the fish are making fast runs and we're running them down. And then it's a, a battle up and down and just wearing the fish out and following him around with the boat until he's tired. Uh, and the spinning rods are also helpful for me because when I deploy the spread of baits, um, I'll get in a, a rodeo sometimes. It's really fun when the bite's on, you'll get two baits out and behind the boat, boom, boom, both of those go off. You hand them off and people are fighting those fish. And then you grab another bait and you pitch it out the back after you get turned moving towards their fish and everything gets settled a little bit and you'll have another one on. You can keep the whole school with you turned in a circle and catching fish after fish after fish. Uh, and if you just kind of keep everything moving and you keep the baits out, the rest of the school will follow those fish and all that activity and it'll just keep going off. And uh, the spinning reels, I couldn't do it without spinning reels, honestly, because I'm, I'm picking up baits and pitching them out this way all the time and reeling them in real fast and getting them out of the way and I'm moving them all around. So I just, the way I fish with them, uh, the, the spinning reels really work the best for me. And, uh, the, I think you were saying like you have a line or you have something of interest and it's your favorite trolling method is like a crisscross or so just a back and forth and cover what high and low or just. And, and how much ground yeah. are you really covering? Is it just banging it in and out of gear, or are you actually covering some ground when you're trolling? Um, ideally, if you can get your trolling speed to where you're at your lowest idle and you don't have to come out of gear, then that's perfect. Um, you can bump troll if you have to to slow yourself down. Uh, a lot of boats, the way they're set up, you have to do that just when you're pulling smaller baits or fishing like that in general. But um, I prefer to keep it in gear um because that change in um that change in noise and vibration when you come in and out of gear it definitely 
can spook fish if there's a if there's i've seen it in clear water happen if there's a mackerel coming up towards a bait and he's about to make a move on it and that engine bumps in or out of gear he'll shy off and that might have been your shot at that fish it might he might come back but that's i've just seen it happen um so when i do bump troll i try to i try to do it as as little as i can like i'll bump it in gear you know get moving a good pace take it out and then i'll drift as long as i can before i bump it back into gear and if you're uh and with your four line spread and i understand about the staggering all four lines um for a, like a point of reference the closest line would be roughly how far off the back of the boat we call that a prop wash bait and i'll put that just just about as close as we can stand it um the next one i'll put a little bit further behind it 10 or 15 feet just enough to keep them from crossing each other and that bait's usually 20 to 30 feet behind the boat um that second bait so that first one's probably 15 feet behind the boat and the good thing about that with those long fluorocarbon leaders is those two lines are mostly out of the water from the rod tip to the bait and the one the little bit of line that is in the water is 20 pound fluorocarbon so you've got a real stealthy setup for those live baits and then my two long ones, I have rocket launchers in my T-top. And if you can get them up in the T-top for those longer baits, it's great because that helps keep the line out of the water as well. Um, tuna fishermen offshore use, use these kind of stuff, uh, tactics all the time for those finicky fish. And Spanish mackerel are super line shy. And the bigger they are, the worse they are about it. So um, it, it, it can make a huge difference in getting bites by having that smaller tackle, having that fluorocarbon leader having those smaller, perfect size baits and uh, keeping your lines out of the water. And all, all that stuff leads to success when you're fishing for these guys. Man, I, I feel like we've done a good job or you've done a good job of covering this live bait and for Big Spanish. But, you know, before we transition into other tactics for Big Spanish, any final thoughts on live baiting? Any other suggestions you give the people that are like, man, this is sounding like me. We got to go out and do this. Yeah, well, we usually get, um, like I said, our best bite early in the morning. And sometimes when the fish are down, um, you'll have to do some different things to get the bites because everything I've talked about now, uh, up until now, is surface trolling. We've had all our baits up top. And there's a few ways to troll them deeper. You can use downriggers, um, but it's harder to get bites than you would think with that because the Spanish can see the downrigger cable. The, sometimes when you put a downrigger down, in in a finicky fish situation like that it can pull them off of the other baits too um and sometimes it's the only way to get bites but just it works well for kings but i haven't had as much success trolling down riggers for spanish and i think it's because they're a little more uh shy to the vibration of the cable and the the ball down there trolling around um those bigger ones specifically uh i think are and so i usually fish them on the surface and when the surface bites done we're done um, the other way to get them to come up is, uh, live bait, uh, chumming or anchoring up and putting out a chum bag and chopping up some of your smaller baits that you didn't use. Or if you can get a bunch of bait to chum with and just chop, 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 and keep spreading it out there a little bit at a time. Usually if there's fish in that area, you've been marking them, you caught them that morning, if they shut down, do that. And you'll get an extra hour of solid fishing because they'll come right to your boat and they'll, the rest of them that are hungry, will go ahead and finish eating. Um, so that's a good way to do it. Uh, you can fish down riggers if you want to try that route. Um, but usually I just fish the surface until the bite slows down and then we'll go flounder jig in or go in. If the bite's hot, we've usually got more mackerel than we want. So, all right. So I want to follow up a little bit on the anchoring. So if I'm anchoring and, uh, then you're trolling on the surface, it's not really sending a trum bag down or anything. Again, everything's still on the surface. And then you're just letting your live baits out there. Are you still trying to keep four baits out the back or do you have a different approach if you're anchored? If I'm anchored, I'll usually, uh, I like to get the chum going and then um, anchored or trolling. If it's slowing down and you want some activity uh, and especially if, if you have the live well capacity and you got the baits to do it, you can live bait chum um, trolling or at anchor. It works really well at anchor to get the fish drawn up to you immediately um what i will say though is sometimes you can overfeed the fish and over chum the fish and you'll get them see them come up and eat and go crazy and then you won't catch any um that can happen sometimes so usually i avoid live bait chumming until i have to and then i'll start you know working 
and you take six or eight or 12 at the most and chuck them out there and see if the fish come up. And uh, you want to do it after you mark them. If you can, you know, start to see what they look like on the recorder, you mark them and chuck them out there. If, if they're going to feed at all, they'll come right up. And then uh, at anchor, I'll put the chum bags out and then sprinkle some live chum out if I can. And then, like I said, I like to fish those single hook rigs. And what you can do with those is you can hook the menhaden in the back or the uh, bottom in just one treble in them. And then let if you hook them towards the tail, he'll swim away from the boat. So anytime he feels anything tugging at him, he'll keep swimming away. They don't last as long um, but as they do when you're trolling, but usually they won't have to. But if you just take that single hook and hook him in the tail, flip him out there, let him swim away from you, and then he'll keep that tension and kind of keep himself pulling away from the boat. And that really helps you put two or three baits out. Um, I usually put two in the rod holders and then let one or two people hold on to the other ones because they'll have to tend them swimming around and stuff like that. Or, or we'll just fish three baits. But hooking them in the tail helps them stay away from you and keep from getting tangled up when you're sitting still at anchor or if you're on a slow drift because they'll swim away from you. Any bait you can do that with. It, it works really well. Man, I can tell you're dialed into the live bait and that's your preference. Have you had any luck with artificials, anything plastic metal for the big Spanish as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of what we've been talking about works with the live bait is proper presentation. Um, if they're hooked right, they're swimming good, they're the right size, they're on the right, you know, small rigs and everything. Um, and that's going to lead to more bites and bigger fish with these finicky Spanish. And, um, I really like to use, uh, jigging, uh, I really like to use metal jigs for Spanish mackerel in general. And, um, I use them from a half ounce to one and a half ounce, usually uh three quarter ounce and one ounce are my two sizes. I like sting silver jig jigs work really well. Um, there's, Eight, there's a whole host of metal jigs that you can use, but um, I usually like the green, pink, or um, more natural colors. That when the sun's out shining good, the silver usually works the best for me. Silver, sometimes pearl white, um, and then green, blue, uh, and pink as well. But I, the green, th there's a lot of greenback kind of bait fish that are near shore in our area during the Spanish back season and that's always been my favorite color is like a, a light to dark uh green and a, a white or silver bottom on the jig those work really well and presentation makes a lot of difference when you're fishing live bait but it makes all the difference in the world when you're fishing artificials for them um you have to be able to make that jig work properly or a they're not going to bite it or b you're going to get cut off every time you get a bite it can be really frustrating, even once you're experienced catching Spanish mackerel, especially bigger ones on jigs, um, because if, if they're at the surface feeding, you cast one, you rip it by them, and they bite it, it's going at a pace that when they bite it, they're going to come tight fast, and you're going to hook up. They won't usually come off or uh, cut you off as much. But when you're uh, at anchor, which is usually when I catch my bigger Spanish, uh, when we're anchored up chumming and fishing like that, I'll usually take uh, artificial or if the clients want to do it and I'll pitch one down and when those fish go down <clears throat> if you can get located over where they are usually you can get them to take those uh, jigs because it's down there deeper darker I think and they're a little more willing to bite um, but you have to let the jig free fall to get the bite so when you're when you're vertical jigging for them if they're out busting on top cast it and rip it and they'll come grab it but if you're fishing straight up and down for them you really have to jig up high and then follow the exact same pace down with your rod. And so it's free falling, but you're keeping the tension as well. So you're, you're in this little tiny thin line of space between tight and not tight, but you're trying to free fall the exact same pace with your rod tip. So you're keeping it tight, but the bait's free falling and they'll hit it every time on the fall. I've seen them in clear water when you're jigging metal and when you're working it up under the boat, they will follow it every time you jig it hard and fast as you pull up and jig they'll follow that up and they'll dart at it and then as soon as it stops fluttering they'll stop and then they'll turn off of it and they usually don't hit it when it's coming up they usually hit it when it's free falling down and then they'll dart in and grab it but if you don't have that tension to your bait 
as you're free falling, you won't feel them when they hit it to be able to lift up and start to reel and they'll hit it and they'll cut it off like nine times out of 10, you'll go through a lot of jigs, but uh, it's a really fun way to catch them. And if you get, <clears throat> if you get on a good ledge and uh, you get some Spanish mackerel chummed up behind the boat, you can smoke them on those jigs uh, later in the day and you just have to fish them a little deeper, but you'll catch all kinds of stuff on them too. You'll catch sea bass and great trout and everything else, but you'll catch those Spanish usually in the mid to lower water column as it's falling down or after your first fall. So, so instead of bottom jigging it like you would for a bucktail or for sea bass, I'll jig it and wind and work it up through the water column and then I'll free fall back down and follow it the whole way with my rod tip. And that's how I'll fish form with the metal jig. And uh, it, it's a great, the smaller ones especially are great for when they're busting up top. Usually they've got smaller baits up top, <clears throat> little tiny glass minnows and those smaller three quarter ounce silver or uh, green jigs work really well for them and that's just cast it and rip it by them and they'll come grab it um and the other thing i've had a lot of success with them artificial wise honestly has been a fly uh they're real finicky you know fish and a small delicate presentation of a fly a lot of times works better than anything else um and you can do this when you're anchored up chumming is probably the, the easiest time to try to target one doing that uh, especially a big one, you might even be able to sight cast to them and uh, use the live baits. Uh, what I'll do if I'm trying to target one with a fly and I'm trolling, uh, a real good tactic is you put two larger men, Hayden, short, uh, just in the prop wash, you know, 10 to 20 feet behind the boat, and you stand on the back corner of the boat with your fly and you watch. And on, especially on calmer days, you'll see that bait come up to the surface and start getting finicky, or you'll actually fish come up behind it and you'll see him slash you'll just see him start to funnel out there ease that live bait in and just bait and switch them and uh we've had some success doing that for the big spanish with the fly and uh just using usually a, a large clouser minnow or uh those um striped bait fish puglisi patterns work really well so Man, I don't know what I'm most excited about here. I mean, I love scaled down king mackerel gear for live baiting. I'm then I got excited about jigging for Spanish. I mean, I've done my surface casting metal jigs, but now I'm digging jigging. And then you finish by getting me hot for catching a Spanish on the fly. Like I, I think I'm in. I think this podcast is working. The jigging's pretty wild. I've caught Spanish in 200 foot of water uh, jigging metal offshore for you know different species in the winter and early springtime. And uh, a lot of times when we're out on a, a rock in the fall, a little further off, uh, bottom fishing, I'll pop one on a metal jig there. And sometimes those snake kings will show up in places like that really thick. And especially mid to late day, they, they just won't be coming up to the top to feed. But you can send the metal down there. And if you know how to work it, you will get, you will get the bites and catch a lot of mackerel on that metal jig when they get down deep in the middle of the day. Um, and... I'll just say that the Spanish are all about that presentation. And if you're not, if you're, it's not too hard to find the right place. And if you're there in May, June, July, um, you're there at the right time. And if that water clarity is nice and there's some bait around, you'll there, there'll be big Spanish there. And it's just about catching the, the bigger, smarter ones is what makes it a little bit of a challenge. And uh, all the presentation and tactics that we talked about have just been, fine-tuned from years of doing it and just coming down to a science of how to catch those biggest ones and and it comes down to the best presentation well i like that summation i'm going to use that summation as an opportunity to move into the final segment the cooking of the spanish mackerel so you are a you love you love uh to have a good time you like your food you like your drinks so i'm looking forward to what we can do with the spanish mackerel I mean, I'm guilty of, well, I got kids, I'm going to fry it, but I'm going to guess you're going to give me, I mean, we might talk about frying, but, but give me something else, Put, add something to me. All right. So best standard way to cook Spanish mackerel filet, especially a big one, uh, works really well with the big ones, is I'll take the whole filet, cut in half if you really need to, uh, to fit on your grill or in your oven and just marinate that for an hour uh, in Italian dressing zesty italian is my preferred dressing and then uh put it on tin foil either on the grill or in the oven and just put it skin side down and let it cook uh don't flip it just let it cook all the way up through 
And as soon as you can flake the fattest part of the meat out with a fork, it's ready to go. And then you take a spatula and the meat will peel right off of the skin. The skin will stick to the tin foil. You crumple it up, throw it in the trash. Your grill's clean, your oven's clean, your fish is ready. And uh, that's, that's a super easy, excellent way to do it. And then you can top it off with some salt, pepper, garlic, lime, any kind of other seasons you like when you grill fish. Um, but that zesty Italian gives it a good flavor. And uh, that's probably the simplest and, and most effective way to get it done. And then uh, something that I really like doing with the Spanish, if I've got time, especially big ones, um, is I'll fillet them off of the skin and I'll fillet the middle part uh, out, the, the bloodline. And so you're basically left with the tenderloins of the Spanish mackerel fillet. <clears throat> and it's really clean meat, excuse me. It's really clean meat. And uh, if you're gonna fry Spanish, that's the way to do it. Go ahead and you gotta have a sharp knife and, and go kind of slow but you can get that uh, clean meat off of there and all the red meat and skin leave alone. And that's what you want to fry or black in or pan sear. Um, so that's really just about all how, all how you clean the filet off the fish, uh, cooking it that way. And then my favorite way probably to do it uh, is to do what I was just talking about. Um, and then you can take those pieces and either smoke them or boil them, uh, depending on what's easier for you or if you do or don't like smoky flavor. And then uh, you just process that into fish salad or fish dip. And we do a lot of smoked fish dip with it and it's fantastic. You just process that with uh, cream cheese, sour cream, chives, purple onion, um, any kind of those acumen that you like to add. And uh, we chop all that up and mix it all together. A little salt, pepper, paprika, and capers and some good crackers and that when you get a bunch of them and you're going to have a lot of meat uh mackerel doesn't freeze all that well to be honest and so when you're mackerel fishing there's no giant need to take more than what you need for a couple meals or a big fish uh fish cooking just because it doesn't freeze all that well but if you do um clean that meat off of the uh clean pull that clean meat off and freeze that. And that, that will hold a lot better than if it has the skin on and the bloodline in it. But there's three good ways to do it. And it's very, very, very good fresh. Uh, so don't let the mackerel uh, lure turn you away from them at all. They're very good fresh. You just got to do some work with them if you're going to freeze them. Rob Corley, we are wrapping up this podcast episode. And I know you have so many different arrows in your quiver. So in the summertime when you're not Spanish mackerel fishing, what else are you doing? And then take me into the fall. This summer, we're going to be doing a lot of that and uh, a lot of red fishing in the backwaters and catching sheep's head and black drum with them. Um, we'll be doing a little bit of nearshore fishing for mackerels. And when the flounders come in to season in the fall uh, or late summer in the fall, we'll be after those. And uh, later in the fall, we'll have a lot more speckled trout showing up. And so we'll be after all those inshore species and a lot of king mackerel group are fishing uh, in the fall, too, because they start to come in close. And uh, hopefully we'll get a little sprinkling of cobias to come see us here in May and June. And hopefully that bite will be going on while this is coming out. And uh, we'll be chasing those around, too. And then uh, in my spare time, I'm going to be having a beer out of my not Corey's <laughs> Redfish Champions trophy. Ah, and thinking about you guys. <laughs> nice touch. That's perfect. <laughs> you know, you won the prize <laughs> on our December issue. Billy and I have said several times, like you won the creative prize yeah. for tuning in yeah. while you're polishing your trophies. You you won hands down. And uh, you get a you're, trophy for that, Gary? Or uh, I'm gonna <laughs> look. I'm gonna <laughs> see if I have a not Corey trophy I can send your way. Oh man, that would be awesome. It would be. Rob Corley, thank you so much for talking with us. Hey, it's always a pleasure, man. Enjoyed it. And uh, go Fisherman's Post. We love you guys. All right, man. Thank you. you. <laughs> Billy. Too much fun, man. Too much fun. All that food talk got me hungry, dude. I was over here like, God, I wish you'd shut up already. I'm hungry. Man, I knew at the beginning of the show your Billy's Best Takeaway was going to be food-based. I knew it. Oh, Gary. You it's just, okay to be a little predictable. You, you just thought it would. You just <laughs> thought it would. But in Billy's notes that I have here, <laughs> let's see if it is. Let's open up the little black book and see what's inside. 
Oh, here we go. How to hook the men Hayden in the tail is what my best takeaway was <laughs> to get it to swim away from the boat. There you go. It's dear. a good tip. It huh. is a good tip. I'm huh. proud of you for grabbing Gary. onto that. Yeah, dude, that was an awesome tip. I mean, you had to write it down yeah. so you didn't forget it. I'm I'm not buying into this black book delivery. No, this is notes, man. This is <laughs> notes that I take. <laughs> Billy's notes. <laughs> It's going to be available in a PDF version soon enough. Don't worry about it. Okay. Billy's best takeaways from all our episodes. Awesome. Where do I buy? <laughs> oh, gosh. That's funny. Oh, Gary, man. Come on, dude. That was uh, that was a good episode, and that was a good takeaway. I can't believe you thought I was going to be talking about food for the takeaway. <laughs> It was. I mean, that was one of the better tips. Dude, I mean, it but was it was a, it, it was yet again another podcast chock full of information. Dude, yeah, it was crazy. And I love the the piece at the end where he just breaks out his trophy, has his beer. It was funny, man. Yeah, if I'm a viewer or a listener, I don't know whether I want to take that information and try it myself or if I just want to call him and book a trip and just spend more time with him. Sure, yeah, just book a trip. Like, forget it. That's what Gary does. He doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't fish by himself. He books trips. <laughs> Easy. Um. <laughs> Will someone just give me a fish to hold for the photo? Will someone? <laughs> oh, my goodness, man. I That's... want the sun in my face. I don't want the sun behind me. Will someone give me yeah. a fish? They don't even make you lay in the bottom of the boat either. They always make me lay in the bottom of the boat. Hold this. <laughs> oh, dude. Anything else we got on the docket? I don't think so. What a good no, show. No, we want to thank Marine Warehouse Center, part of the fishing community, part of the boating community, certainly certainly key in making this podcast a reality. Mm -hmm. Like It is built up in large part by Marine Warehouse Center. We appreciate them. Absolutely, man. We appreciate them. Go support them, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Fishing is back.